Hey everyone, today we're going to look at this Compact ProLiant DL380. This thing came out in the year 2000. HP bought Compact just two years later and the Compact name kind of went away over the years. They still make these DL380 ProLiants. It's actually very hard to find information about this particular Gen 1 online because there's 11 generations of them now. We're going to do a hardware overview, see what's going on inside. It's got two Pentium 3s, which is what kind of piqued my interest about picking it up in the first place. We'll do a software deep dive. It's got a very particular and frustrating way to access the BIOS on it. We'll do a deep dive on that. The ultimate goal here is to get Windows, probably Windows 2000 running on this thing today and play around, you know, load some games on it or something. The game plan is I really wanna get these compact flash to IDE converters working inside this thing. Right now it only has SCSI drives available to it. And I picked up all these converters and the compact flash drives we need. I haven't done this before. I'm not very optimistic about it working, so worst case scenario, we'll just throw an actual SCSI drive in there and get Windows loaded on it that way. Along the way, we're gonna do something really interesting, which is take a look at this complete inbox, except for the power supply, lights out PCI management card. This was Compaq's way that you would remotely manage these enterprise servers back in 2000. This lights out management board should be pretty exciting to set up. So rather than onboard, options like you have in a modern server today, this thing was actually a card you need to install. And I don't know much about it other than this one looks like maybe it was never even used. So that's gonna be fun to set up. But first we'll get you acquainted with the hardware on this thing. So let's get into it. All right, we'll give you a really quick walk around before we pull the lid off. It's got two Pentium 3s inside has a bay of four SCSI disks. So this came, I think it came stock with a SCSI controller on the, the main board. That's how you access these disks. You could have an add-on to add a few more SCSI disks here with a second controller. Obviously this one didn't come with that. CD-ROM drive, that'll be important later. A three and a half floppy, nice little set of panels there for indication and turning it on. And it used to be used for files, apparently. Let's look at the back. On the back here, it's got a one gigabit fiber NIC, which is probably pretty impressive for 2000. It's got another SCSI controller, which is a absolute monster. We'll dive into that in a second. Another SCSI port on board just for tapes, I think, tape drives. It's got a NIC, VGA, the usual suspects over here, PS2 mouse and keyboard, a couple serial ports, parallel printer port, and it's got some redundant power supplies. Top comes off without tools. These three thumb screws here. That one is easy to forget. And then over here on the bottom of the lid, we've got all sorts of information about what's going on, as you might expect in an enterprise server of the era. In here, we've got this airflow baffle. And unfortunately on the bottom, it's using this disintegrating foam, which is a shame. There's our two Pentium 3s and their corresponding voltage regulators. This was optional, so I think this came with one Pentium 3 by default. This one happens to have two. I think they're 800 megahertz. We'll find out when we post. Deep down in here, hiding in that foam, is the RAM. I'm not going to bother pulling it out for now. I think it's got half a gig. We will also find out when we post this thing. And let's get on to these cards. So here's a compact branded one gigabyte fiber NIC. We'll be pulling that out. We won't need it. It's got really nice toolless access to the cards. That's pretty nice. Let's pull this out. Take a closer look at this guy. This would have been pretty hot stuff, I think, back then. <laughs> but we won't be needing it. And then we've got this absolute monster of a SCSI controller. Like, this thing looks like another computer, <laughs> which is pretty wild. It looks like it's a Smart Array 35. 5300 controller, excuse me, we'll see that when we post. It's got four SCSI ports on the back and two more inside, which is pretty impressive. I think we'll leave that in so we can see exactly what it is. And let's post this thing and see what's going on. All right, we're pulling out all the stops for this guy. We got the Microsoft Natural Elite Ergonomic Keyboard, PS2, beautiful. And a new old stock compact PS2 mouse. Looks good to me. All right, got it plugged in. And while plugged in, you can see it's 
giving power to this riser board with the PCI stuff on it, and I can hear a fan spinning for the power supply. So even when the machine isn't on, it's just being given power. It's always drawing about seven watts. And that would have been frustrating until I realized it's probably because you could plug in lights off management stuff. So <laughs> we, will, we will get to that. So let's turn it on. It's not that loud. I'll put a decibel meter starting up. Beautiful. They don't do this anymore. There's no character. <laughs> All right, so it thinks it found 512 megabytes of RAM. Looks like we've got two 800 megahertz Pentium 3s. I think that thing it just initialized is the SCSI controller inside the main board. And you can see in slot two, it says it's got an HP Smart Array 5304. So that's what that big monster SCSI controller is. And now you'll notice there's no way to get to the BIOS. If I do F1 to continue, it's gonna beep twice about not being able to find a bootable disc, either in the hard drive, well, there's no hard drive in it, either in the CD-ROM or the floppy drive. So that's gonna send us down our next adventure, which is the compact smart start and system configuration utility discs. All right, so as you saw with these old ProLiance, you can't really just go into the BIOS like you would on any other normal x86 machine. So I'm trying to figure out like the boot order of this thing or whatever. So I start looking online and on the like, you know, four forum posts you can find on this stuff, which to HP's credit, they're still hosting. Uh, you do get confirmation that you need something called the smart start CD, or you can boot the system configuration utility off of floppies. So. Of course, I head over to the Internet Archive. I find a copy of Compact Smart Start and Support Software, release 4.5. It's era appropriate. This one happened to be from 1999, and it does claim to be bootable, and it claims to have the system configuration utility, which I think is what I need to do. That's the BIOS, I think. Uh, so I whipped out my trusty <laughs> industrial-grade CD burn-in setup uh, and went to town. But pop this thing in and nothing. The CD-ROM drive just kind of spins and spins and spins. Couldn't really get it to work. So at this point I'm like, well, I don't know if I don't have a working CD-ROM drive or something's wrong with this smart start thing. So I started diving into getting the floppies working. So I found a copy of the compact system configuration utility diskette builder online. You can search this soft pack number. That's what Compaq used to call these um, software releases, I think. And, you, and you'll find copies of this. And it ends up being six executables. And you're supposed to run the first one, SP19619. And of course, this isn't going to work on 64-bit Windows. I mean, this thing is ancient, so it's complaining. Um, not compatible with the version of Windows you're running. This is a 64-bit machine. These are probably 16-bit executables. These are probably written in the 90s. So I thought, okay, I know how to solve that problem. I'll fire up Windows XP. So here we are in Windows XP. I seem to use Windows XP a lot on this channel. <laughs> anyway, these are the six executables that come in the soft pack for the diskette creation utility. You're supposed to run the first one. So you go ahead and do that. And you get this guy. And it's even older than I thought. It is from 1996, I guess. <laughs> so you page down to get the license agreement. You type agree and then enter. And from these six executables, it generates a new one. You run that. I guess they were doing, they were breaking these things up, I guess, so you could download them one at a time since bandwidth wasn't what it is today, I guess. I, I'm not sure. So at this point, I was like, okay, I'm cruising. I'm about to make these diskettes. And I pulled out my equally as impressive floppy drive setup because <laughs> I can pass that through uh, either USB from the Proxmox host, this is running in Proxmox, or you know Windows Remote Desktop. Plenty of ways to get that disk drive over to here. And so you go ahead and you run through this and it's going to have you create four diskettes from this executable. I don't know why they don't just ship the files or the diskette images, but uh, you go ahead and do that and it crashes. It's doing something Windows does not like, or at least this version of Windows. 
And going back to XP was about as far as back as I wanted to go to deal with this. <laughs> so you can see it's complaining about the 16-bit MS-DOS subsystem. That's what this stuff was written against the Windows APIs from the 16-bit era because it's so old. That didn't work. <laughs> then I had the bright idea, okay, well, let's pop that smart start disk I made back in and, and see what's actually on it. So check this out. Compact Diskette Builder. So what claimed to be Smart Start 4.5 on Internet Archive, unless I'm really misunderstanding what I'm doing here, uh, is actually, it likes to be in this upper left corner because it was written a million years ago and Windows is probably confused. It's actually the Diskette Builder. <laughs> so you can uh, tell it to build, where is it? There we go. Compact System Configuration Utility version 2.48. So I, I'm telling you this huge story because I think it's fascinating that this thing even runs on Windows 11. <laughs> this thing is over 20, it must be 20, written 25 years ago. I think it's impressive that they must have used such low level and basic APIs that Windows 11 is still able to run this application, <laughs> which I find incredible. Long story short, that's why I brought you on this journey. Long story short, you get this thing to dump the files out to disk and they don't work. The floppy disks don't work. I can't get it to work. So I went back to the drawing board and believe it or not, on the HP Enterprise website, there is a Smart Start CD ISO from 2002 and it works. So let's burn this one and actually make some progress. We have to see that intro screen one more time. Incredible. All right, let's make some actual progress here, shall we? I'll talk while this thing boots. I'm pretty sure the reason these are scarce to find online, these copies of Smart Start, is because you used to have to pay Compact or HP. I'll press F1 here, see what happens. And the reason I think this is because you'll see it when it loads. I'm pretty sure it's just Windows. <laughs> it's a slimmed down ver version of Windows that they probably themselves licensed from Microsoft. And Microsoft was probably charging them per copy. The disk is clanging away there. You can see it blinking. So I'll bring you back when this actually gets around to booting. And there you go. Isn't that the most 2000s thing you've seen? I mean, they just, that splash screen. <laughs> they really just like, that's how I feel right now, launching compact smart start for servers version 5.5. They just nailed it. So you can tell this looks a little bit like Windows, doesn't it? And we've got mouse support. I think that's the default Windows 95 background color. Uh, yeah, so that's why I think this might have been licensed from Microsoft. <laughs> so here we are, uh, obviously in some version of Windows. So we can run the system configuration utility. This is how you get into the BIOS on these ProLiant machines. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. So there it goes. I think it knows I removed that nick, which is kind of interesting. Let's take a look. So the reason I wanted to even get in here is to see if this had an onboard IDE controller. The documentation does says it doesn't, even though the CD-ROM is IDE, and there is a slot for an IDE cable. I don't think it actually has a controller. So you can go over here. It's got a embedded IDE controller, standard interface enabled a second controller, um, and then unfortunately, even though there's a spot for another IDE cable and the CD-ROM is IDE, it claims IDE fixed disks are not supported on this system. So we're going to have to throw a PCI IDE card in. But beyond that, uh, there's not a lot in here that you wouldn't find in any other, you know, normal BIOS. Here's the, it, it's picking up all the, the processors, Pentium 3 running at 800 megahertz down all the RAM, you know, everything else. So, so what we're gonna do is take out that smart controller card, and throw in a PCI card. All right, we're gonna take this huge SCSI controller out because we don't need it. And we're gonna put in this PCI to IDE controller and this blank, you know, slot that converts IDE to compact flash to make it easy to use this as a hard drive. I really doubt that this is going to work. 
<laughs> I just picked this up randomly on eBay. I think it's it's PCI, just like this, but it's relatively new. I'd be, I don't really know, never done this before. I, I'm having my doubts that this thing's just gonna recognize it and, and treat it as an IDE controller, but that's what we're gonna try first. And if that doesn't work, we'll throw a SCSI drive in. All right, here's the setup. Got that IDE controller here. I think that is the primary coming off into this IDE to compact flash converter. And I'm stealing some power for it off this Molex chain that was floating around in the case. So yeah, let's get this thing to post and see if it even sees that card. Look at that. All right, so it definitely sees the IDE controller card. But something's wonky with my power setup here, so this clearly doesn't have power. Uh, I'm going to go diagnose what I need to do here. The voltages were right, so I, I have another one of these adapters. I picked up a couple. This is a different style. Uh, and it's turning on, so let's we'll see what we get. Same deal, but that's okay. I think I need to format that card. Okay, I'm cautiously optimistic that I'll get that working. So let's turn our attention over to the remote management card. Wanted to show a close up before I install it. It's got an Intel processor on it. Compact branded, of course, 1999-2000. I don't think this has ever been used. It kind of just smells brand new, you know what I mean? And it's, wants it to be in a certain slot, I will be consulting the user's guide. It's got video, a NIC, and this keyboard mouse setup. So yeah, I'm gonna go read about this thing. I think we should be able to get it working and actually mount OS ISOs over the net with it, uh, which is why I wanted to do this before dealing with the hard drive any further. All right, first hurdle. It wants to be in slot one. The documentation says it needs to be there. There's usually this plastic bracket for the cards to slide in. You can see these slots right there that the edge of the card slides in. It doesn't fit because on this machine, someone has bent this out. It's supposed to look like that. So uh, I'll figure out how to push that back in. All right, yeah, that was bizarre. So it was bent just enough so that this card wouldn't fit in that slot. You can see it takes up the whole length. All right, it's in there now. I'm gonna go do some more reading. All right, as far as I can tell, this is the minimum configuration I need. It takes over as the video display for the machine. This is a power a barrel jack for power in case these don't have power, you can still interact with it. I'm gonna, I don't have that. Uh, I'm gonna hope it's not necessary. <laughs> Got a NIC, obviously. More on that in a second. And then this wild cable passes mouse and keyboard over to the original inputs and lets me inject my mouse and keyboard here. Something to do with being able to take over the mouse and keyboard. And on this tag that was warning me about using the right PCI slot, which I would not have done, I, was, I would just throw it in the easiest one. So I guess they needed to do that, it must be important. There is some very useful information on the back. So theoretically, it's gonna have this DNS name I can hit the moment we power all this up and the default username and password and we should be able to go to a browser and talk with this thing. Let's try it out. So in addition to browser-based setup, we should be able to see it post and do some sort of ROM-based setup. It's on now, we'll see what happens. So that's a good sign. We're using the video through that card. This is not the original VGA port and we're seeing, <laughs> we're seeing something. Uh, let's see what it does. Yeah, look at that. F8 to configure. Oh, it jumped. Uh, it was too late. It jumped to the ID. All right, got in that time. Look at this. All right, it's got an IP address. Let's go talk to it from a browser. All right, back uh, with everyone's favorite browser, IE7. This thing claims it's at 192.168.1.219. <laughs> oh, look at this. Oh, come on. 
Yeah, that's fine. All right, look at this. Remote Insight Lights Out Edition. And I'm going to have to fix Java or something. I'll be right back. All right, I think we need to install Java 2, aka 1.3, which is around the year that this card was made, 2000. I had Java 6 on here. I do want the plugin. Yeah. Okay, I'll be back. Ha uh ha! -huh. It worked. Uh, let me find that. <laughs> let me find the username and password. All right, just needed an older version of Java for now. Administrator seventy-five PW. Hopefully that's still valid. Now oh, check this out. Okay. Yeah, I don't think this thing was ever used. What do we want to do? Let's look at. I don't know. This is just the status of the card itself. It's from 2000. Oh, I was hoping you could do a virtual CD-ROM drive, but you can only do a virtual floppy, which is still which is still pretty cool. But I guess that won't help us install Windows 2000, will it? Um, you know, let's look at if we can see the machine. Sort of. <laughs> can I interact with it? This is, I can. This is pretty cool, actually. Let's exit that. Yeah, look at that. You can, re you truly can remotely access it. I'm watching it over there on the screen. All right. Well, this was a success. This is really cool. I think I'll do a deep dive on this in another video someday. Let's see if we can get Windows 2000 installed on that compact flashcard. Messed around for hours to get a copy of Smart Start working, and it came with the Lifesoft management card. <laughs> I had my very own shrink wrapped copy the, this entire time. All right, we've got Windows 2000 in there. I don't know, I've never messed with these compact flash cards, so I don't know if I'm gonna need to format it in another machine first or whatever. But we'll see if the Windows 2000 installer can handle it. I also don't know if the PCI car, <laughs> card is hooked up right, the IDE card. I'm not gonna lie to you, when it fails the IDE scan with firmware is not ready, that kinda, kinda makes me nervous. <laughs> uh, let's see if we can boot to CD after this. That's That CD drive is finicky. It might be on its way out or needs a cleaning. <laughs> takes, sometimes it takes a couple tries to get it to properly boot the disk. <laughs> Inaccessible boot device. All right, I'll, uh, I'll mess with that drive. Believe it or not, I was prepared for just such an event and picked up a USB compact flash reader, so... We'll see if I can get one of these cards in the right state and maybe just even see if I can preload it with a version of Windows. All right, well, I got it cleaned up and partitioned with a disk utility in Windows. And I think we got further. <laughs> Let's press enter now. No, oh, I can't find the hard disk. Uh, all right, back to the BIOS. That's better though, it didn't crash. Well, it's exactly what I didn't want to do which is sacrifice one of my SCSI drives to this driver, array. Right? You can see right there. But compact one this round and check it out. We've got Windows 2000 running, runs really well. And of course, what else would you do with it than run the Doom shareware wad on my dual processor Pentium 3 server from 2000. <laughs> it runs really great. It's a, actually a really nice machine. Got online right away. Didn't have to install any drivers or anything. All right, so this was the original setup, and there were a ton of variables and things that went wrong such that I couldn't use the flashcard. So this thing was having firmware issues and didn't work at all. 
this thing never even powered on. <laughs> and I, I don't know if that one was okay. So switched over to another IDE controller. This one worked great, showed up right away. I could see this card and then obviously switched over to another IDE to flash adapter. It also saw that card, no problem. But I think the issue is this guy doesn't recognize them in the BIOS. I could only get this integrated controller to be the boot, a valid boot device. And anything I did on any Windows installation, so I even popped in Windows 98, it couldn't find disks. Windows 2000 couldn't find disks. So it's probably some combination of firmware on this guy to support a IDE mass storage controller as the boot device, drivers for all of it, and whatever. So I, I went off and made a RAID 0 with that drive there with the compact tools. That was pretty much effortless and took no time at all. And then as you can see here, Windows 2000 install was a breeze, didn't have a single problem there. Uh, and got it up and running and installed Doom, of course, even though I have a sound card. It's kind of a bummer. <laughs> but anyway, well, not entirely how I wanted that to go, but this thing's up and running. Runs really great. I can't stress that enough. Just kind of clicking around Windows and running stuff. Really smooth, really nice. The video is actually running through this, the lights off controller on its VGA port, and it plays Doom just fine. Maybe the onboard video would be a little better. Obviously, it's ridiculous to you know, have this as my new gaming rig, but <laughs> I thought it'd be fun to at least play around with it a little bit. And then, yeah, this whole compact flash to IDE adventure, this was probably not the right machine to, to start learning how to do this on. <laughs> really cumbersome to work through the smart start every time. And it doesn't have a normal BIOS. You can't just, you know, flip it around and tell it which boot order. Uh, it's all very enterprisey, and I will admit, the moment I wasn't going against the grain and I just used their tools to make a RAID array and everything, I mean, that took seconds. It was pretty effortless. So they had an ecosystem they were doing something with. <laughs> I think I'm more partial to Sun and uh, their LOM stuff, but don't know if I'll have more videos on this specifically. Maybe if I do anything more interesting with it. I'll have, I think I will have another video on this guy though. I think there's probably a lot we could dive into in that interface and actually get this hooked up with remote power switches and everything. I think that'd be kind of interesting. But in the meantime, really hope you enjoyed this video. It was fun bringing this guy back to life. I think this is a fascinating piece of enterprise equipment and uh, pretty historically relevant if you kind of package it all together with the software you had to run on it to configure it. Stuff like this lights off management, super fascinating. So thanks for watching. And as always, I'll see you in the next one.